Um, so welcome all to the PBA's latest um, educational webinar. Delighted to have both Adam Coyle and Annette Gibbons on today's session, um, Building Better Bureaus. A um, couple of housekeeping points, if you can just remain on mute. Um, we will also be recording this session, so that will go on our website um, most likely tomorrow. And we will run a question session at the end where if you could use the raise hand function, I'll unmute the individuals that wish to ask questions. So without further ado, I will introduce you to Adam from Beaver and Struthers and Annette Gibbons from Think Payroll. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Haig. Um, yeah, as mentioned today, what we're looking at um, is building a better bureau. Now, we're not here to kind of preach this is the exact way of doing it, and there's not necessarily one exact way of doing it. Um, we're going to share some experiences that we've had um, in our sort of past um, and also start to get you to think of what you may want to change and, and looking at evolution in, in general. Um, as with, you know, being part of the PBA, it's it's nice that, you know, something um, is empowering change um, and we want to obviously get you to think that way for your own businesses as well. Um, so firstly, Haig, if you, if you don't mind clicking onto the next slide for me. So yeah, section one, we're going to look at analysing your department uh, processes and potentially what your overall service offering may look like. Um, and I'm going to also touch on um, something called Agile methodology. Now, some may be aware of it already, um, and that's great. Um, if you're not, it, it will literally be the basics of it. There's multiple courses and, and further sort of um, areas where you can expand your knowledge on further, and I will point you in the direction of that. It's just getting a basic understanding of what Agile is and how it may help you um, sort of change. Um, so, yeah, next slide. So hopefully what I'm going to look to cover um, is what I call the power of five. So why you should be assessing or analysing your current model, be it process structure or product offering. Um, the next element, we'll look at the basics of working using agile methodology in a payroll environment and how implementing agile could potentially assist with improvements or new opportunities. We'll look a little bit at the technology and what tools can be worked with um, to assist with Agile methodology. Hopefully, we'll get you to look at opening your mind and look at possible opportunities for yourselves in your business, whatever role that may be that you undertake within your business. It, it doesn't really matter. We want to get you to try and think and actually um, possibly, you know, pose questions to, to people above. Um, and then the final one is how the power of teamwork and collaboration working in Agile methodology uh, can improve productivity and service offering. So first of all, starting with it, what I hope um, to want to do with yourselves throughout the first element of the session is create a little journey. So if you've got paper to hand or even electronically on a phone, on a tablet, if you just make a little note of questions one to nine, now I call them questions, not everyone is a question, it's a task, it's a, a short snippet. Um, but hopefully we'll create a journey together so that it can kickstart your revolution. Um, and we'll, we're looking at this whole reimagining um, the service offering, reimagining payroll potentially. And um, so if you've done that, the first question I pose is what does your business do? And you may see things up there that you think, yeah, that's that's it. We process payroll. We, you know, might be linked with an accounts firm like myself. We operate payroll accounts, audit tax, et cetera. Uh, and that's what people mainly think you do. That, that's it. That's all we do, process payroll. However, coming on to the next slide, if you start to analyze further, and, and apologies that there are many on there, hopefully that comes through clearly, Essentially, we're not just a processor. We don't just run accounts, run tax, do personal tax, etc. You become so much more within your role. Now, whether that's a HR role, a payroll role, etc., you're you're playing a part in the wider business and also servicing clients differently each time. So you become friends potentially with them, you become a coach, a mentor. Um, you know, you become support networks for these clients of yours rather than just someone that processes payroll. Um, and again, I think sometimes we forget that actually you become so much more. 
and it's sometimes taking that step back to actually look and think actually you know what actually am i to this person or to this client and so i think that's really something good to, to do and it's one thing that i kind of tend to do at least once a year with the majority of our clients um is say actually what what sort of role am i taking with you am i just yes there's someone that can process you your payroll or actually do, do i become a lot more for you so if we we move on um the, the next element I wanted to touch on, and this is where we start with our, our little journey together, is, is bearing in mind the, of those sort of roles that I've kind of stated we potentially become. I want you to now think of why you do things in your role or in your department, in your business. You know, do you do something because someone else has told you to do it that way? Um, is it because it's always been done that way? Um, you know, the, the age old sort of story. Oh, yeah, it, it, I kind of did this and Sue before me did it, Janet before her did it, etc. Um, is it because th that's a process? You know, there's a documented process and that is why I do something. Um, or is it the fact that, you know, you, you genuinely just do something because your boss has told them you to do it or even, you know, their boss above them has told you to do it. Um, and obviously, you know, the jokey one on there, the office cats potentially got involved and, and said it was a good idea to operate that way. So on this first element and, and just a very brief, you know, kind of thing is I want you to try and pick a, be it a process or a task, something that you do in your role or department um, and try and think and expand why you do it. Now, it might be actually communicating between the staff members. You know, is there a set way you communicate with your team? Do you use a certain app? Do you use email only? Do you do it only in meetings? It could be sending out reports for a client. Is there a set process how you do it? It can be anything from, you know, a small task to a larger task, but try and have a, a sort of process or task in mind of what you, what you currently do and why you currently do it. Um, and we'll evolve and, and expand on it a little further throughout the session. Uh, so moving on, the next thing that I would always touch on and, and what, again, it, it's not me preaching this is the right way to do it, but it's me trying to get you to say, actually, have I done this before? Do I do this? Do I analyse? Um, and, and one thing is actually mind map sort of what your service offering is. So everything in your day to day sort of operations that affects the service you're providing your clients now to give you again a couple of examples on here it could be you take phone calls you send emails you might send letters um, you might send newsletters you might have an electronic version of a newsletter um, but anything that is going to affect your service offering you know it, it could be actually sort of working with your software companies that ultimately is affecting what service you can provide to clients um, and again moving on to sort of your next question shall we say um, so following the the element of, in section one of picking a process or a task you know that you may have in mind can you now expand from that question and and say actually how does that task that process that I've now picked how does it actually affect my overall service offering so if you, someone did pick communicate in between uh, team members what you know what is that actually impacting how is it impacting your overall service if it was sending out a report in a set way again you know go into sort of looking at how is that affecting the service i'm providing a client so again just want you to start to think in that sort of mindset um next slide please um, and from that, so really expanding, like I said, I, I tend to do these sort of analyses once a year at least. Um, it's not wrong to do it more up more frequent. Um, and one thing we kind of discussed um, when setting up this session was, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on, on the sector itself has been massive, not through least the fact that we've possibly, you know, gained more work through sort of CGRS claims, etc. Um, but one thing that really hit home and it hit home with me is that COVID-19 shouldn't necessarily have been a driving force to change process or to even analyse your current model. Um, but one thing that, that is for sure, and I'm sure we'll all sort of testify to it, 
he's, he will definitely have been a, a major player in actually assessing how we do things. For example, you know, from day one of when lockdown kicked in, you were all sort of working remotely. Were you set up to be able to work remotely originally? Possibly not. Um, and things will have had to change, be it how you store things, if you were still in the old format of printing and storing files, etc. Overnight that changed. Um, so again, it, you know, it, it isn't to say that, you know, it's wrong not to, but, you know, hopefully COVID will actually fast track some of these analysis and you may have already started. Um, and like I say, it shouldn't have been the driving force, but it, it can guarantee it probably will be going forward and, and hopefully businesses like yourselves coming on sort of calls like this it will kind of change the sector in, in general and um, so picking up from question three is again sticking in mind if you've picked that Tesco process originally now I want you to start to think has that element changed since COVID-19 so if you were to look at that process in January February has it changed since going remote potentially? Um, has it potentially been difficult? Um, or has it got easier with the impact? So again, just to you know, make a bit of a note if you want, just of, of how that's potentially impacted your chosen process or task. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and what I then want to cover at this point um, is why we're sort of, would analyze so we're, we're on the sort of journey now to sort of analyzing and we've only sort of potentially picked one one stream at the moment um, but i think it's important when analyzing and when sort of um looking at an overall 360 view of things is to actually understand why you're potentially doing it and again it doesn't matter what role that you may be in in, in your business um, but ultimately, with any sort of change, you, you know, you can all have an impact as to why you would analyse something. Um, some that I've put up there, you know, could be as, as simple as, yeah, you know, do we want to save time in our business from a processing point? Is it a cost saving mechanism? So if it's a hierarchy thing, you know, if people up the chain are getting involved, it could be that you want to save a bit of money um, on either a process, streamlining a process, etc. Um, other things that I think people sometimes forget um, is actually you may want to change something to improve your overall team morale um, or actually to develop team members. So, you know, the, just because something's been done one way doesn't mean it's the only way it can be done and doesn't mean it should be the only way it can be done going forward. You know, people may come in and, you know, you may even get different new starters come in with different ideas. And one thing I like to try and promote is ideas from all levels and all people. I mean, it actually may be an idea from your client that you pick up on. You know, it's not bad to get feedback from clients on how to do things, it's how you use that. So again, developing team members, they, they may want to develop and if you can change things to help them develop, then, you know, why wouldn't we want that? Um, other couple of things on there, like I said, you may want to offer new services. Um, you know, in, in the business that we're in, um, ultimately a, a lot of people do just think you process someone's pay. Obviously there's a lot more to it, you know, to make sure you're getting it right. Um, and ultimately, you know, most people work to get paid. Let's, let's not be around the bush. At the end of the day, you come to the end of your month, your week, you, you're happy that you've received that pay and it's right. However, as a business, you may want to offer different services. You may want to offer advice, you know, rather than just process. So that's why we want to start to look. And again, there could be endless sort of things that we put on air. And I want to try and encourage um, you to think of, of more ways to why you might analyze and want to change. And, and again, hopefully kind of question four, we'll do that. So using again, you know, that sort of further detailed analysis, again, can you expand now? And if you feel your process that you chose or your task um, should evolve, so should it actually change the, the process you've now picked, say, at the start, is there a case for it to change, be it one that I've mentioned or be it one that you can think of yourself? And again, just make a little note of that somewhere if you're, if you're kind of playing along with us. Moving on. Um, so, yeah, a lot, lot to sort of throw at you in, in the session. And some things like, again, you know, I say you, you may have already come across these 
um, ways of working and, and these sort of elements to analyze in. Um, and, and I understand it could be a lot to take in, but one of the most simplest ways to analyze further meaning is a SWOT analysis. A simple being, is something a strength in your business? Is it a weakness? Is the room and the opportunities there? Or is there an actual threat? Um, and obviously, the, you know, the majority of people, we want things in that strength element. That's what people, you know, ultimately, if, when they're first doing these, they say, yeah, they're all my strengths. That's great. I personally prefer my weaknesses and my opportunities. Um, the reason being is, can we evolve those to turn them into a strength? You know, strengths are great, and ultimately you want to keep your strengths in there. Weaknesses and opportunities, for me, are the biggest ones to turn into a strength. Ultimately, you still got to keep your eye on your threats, though. Um, and for those that have done these in, in the past, obviously a threat could impact any one of a number of things that is currently a strength as well. Um, so again, I think taking the time out in your business to, to fully analyze everything you do, and it could be every process you do a SWAT for, you know, as a whole thing, it could be tasks, it could be a general SWAT. But I think trying to do a SWOT analysis every year, six months, a quarter, again, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. Um, and question five to, to lead on is having, again, now your task, try in your mindset to place it in one of those quadrants. So, you know, whatever process you pick, do you think it's the strength of your companies? Is it potentially a weakness? Is it an opportunity or is it a threat? Um, and again, just, you know, quickly do that if you if you're joining along on our journey and we'll uh, we'll move on to the next slide. So this one looking more so now uh, going sort of now I've kind of started to touch on analyzing and why you potentially would do that within your department and, and business. Um, and what I wanted to kind of look at now is is giving you a little insight into a way of doing it. Um, so the question you may be asking yourselves now is what can actually help me change and evolve um, to either be more innovative or to actually challenge the norm and, and challenge those processes that have been in place for months, years, etc. Now, as I've mentioned, there's many ways of working um, that can aid change management. Um, but one thing that I'm going to touch on, and it's one thing that I'm quite passionate about, is agile methodology. And if uh, we kindly move on to the next slide. And for those that have, have maybe looked at Agile in the past or heard of Agile, what, well, what is it? Um, and again, I won't go into the in-depth knowledge. Agile basically came from a background of um, sort of technology development and how software or tech companies would basically operate. Um, so it used to be you, you basically have two main streams. One was waterfall and one being agile waterfall. Someone at the top tends to have the idea and it gets filtered down through the next line, through the next before the, it gets to the people that are working with it. What agile looks at and, and some of my quotes there is it's tending to be the belief I'm working um, sort of more collaboratively. So if I take, for example, the, the middle point there, Agile working is a way of working in which an organization empowers its people to work where and when they choose, but also with maximum flexibility, minimum constraints. Now, basically, all it's ultimately doing is sharing people's knowledge and trying to get everyone's buy-in to work to change or to work to develop something better. Uh, and that's all Agile is. It's it's looking at having open, you know, open discussions between groups of people rather than one person making a, a decision. It's looking at that overall anal analysation and how you analyse things, analysing a group rather than on your own, because you'll all then have different inputs and you can understand and, and learn off each other. Um, it's looking then at strategy from that anal analysation and actually saying, right, now we've, we've kind of analysed what we want to do what do we need to do to, to plan and strategize? Um, then it's executing it, and then it's simply sort of questioning, quality checking, making sure that we've actually evaluated that what we've now implemented works. So if we move on to, to the next slide, what it looks like in a circle is it's a constant cycle of working. 
Um, and it should always be constant. You should always be evaluating something constantly and change and looking at ways to possibly improve. Um, it's buying, so number two, it's buying that suggestions for improvements of multiple people and using the right people um, and potentially different levels of people to get that suggestions in there. Um, it, it's looking at how you apply that um, sort of from your process that's been maybe highlighted that needs change. It's applying, actually designing what that change is. Then, like I said, it's actually implement how you implement. And then the fifth one, again, is that cycle of you need to constantly evaluate. Now, true agile tend to work in quarters. Uh, so every quarter, if you're working on something, they'll put it in a quarter as to when it should be worked on. And again, from an old technology point of view, it works in two week sprints. There's no point getting right to the end and then going, actually, it doesn't work. You might as well try little snippets of it. Does does that now work? Oh yes, it does. Great. Or no, actually, after week two, we've we've tried this element of it and it doesn't work. Right, let's revisit it. So again, I'm not kind of saying you have to completely go whole hog into that, and um, but explore those options, avenues there to explore further ways than in which you could implement this. If we come on to the next one. Um, so what I just wanted to touch on next is just some tools and, and quick sort of areas that can potentially help with Agile. Again, I'd always sort of promote if, you, if you're interested in, in what you've heard, go and research it more. There's loads of, of documentations out there on how to do it. Um, some little quick wins that, that is Agile sort of formatted is using some technology that people may already use like Teams, Microsoft Teams, Asana, Microsoft Planner, Slack, et cetera. Um, other things that people may not be used to um, are actually having things like a product decision team, which is a collaboration of, of people, um, or this daily scrum. So a daily scrum is literally at the start of the day, you may all get together in your team and, and state what you're currently working on, what you worked on yesterday, what you, you know, how busy you are, et cetera. And it's sharing what everyone's doing. Um, and if you've got any problems, for example, getting help off people. So daily scrums are, are options um, and different workflows. So we'll touch a little bit next on, on some um, ways of actually in, instilling workflows into your departments. Uh, so if we move on. Flash up, basically some of the, the software that I uh, spoke about on the last slide are, are in there. So you've got Microsoft Teams being shown ultimately more than anything on there. Um, and, and it's how using um, software in, in um, an agile way can help. So there's um, apps out there that basically you can task um, elements of your role and put tasks to people. You can create teams in Microsoft Teams and actually assign tasks. Um, and I didn't want to focus too much on one product. I use a couple, I use Teams, I use Asana. But again, I'd encourage people, if you're interested in the sort of, you know, sound of some of these ways of working, go out and research some of them um, because they, you know, it is quite um, amazing at actually how they can change your, your ways of working and how important they, they can then become for you and for your business. Um, so next slide, please, if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, one, one thing I was touching on, but this is basically what some of these apps are doing. Um, so a way of working and, and starting to work more agile is creating this sort of um, plan, I suppose, or you, you, most people may know it as like a Kanban flow plan. And it's basically looking in, in these streams of what you got to do, what is currently being worked on, what potentially you're testing and what you've done. Now, this is obviously not necessarily just, you know, your typical payrolls. It's actually, if you're wanting to instill change, be a change to a process, et cetera, you've got all your elements there in your to-do section. These are all the things that I want to change potentially. You're obviously then looking at, have you got anything in progress that you're currently changing? And you start to move where they are. Your backlog becomes basically things that you potentially should be working on or want to work on, but you may not have the time or the resource. Um, and we'll touch on this a little bit later on as to what becomes your backlog. And um, so it's getting into that sort of streamlined versions of thinking in those 
sort of ways in those columns. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing to help with that way of working is instilling a product decision team. Now, some may have heard of a, a PDT before, some may not, but it's this way of collaborating together. So the aim of a PDT is to aid and support future development and growth. Um, typically speaking, you'd, have, you'd, you'd lead someone as an owner. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a senior person. Um, it can just be a motivated person to drive change. It could be someone that is quite open to it. Um, typically, again, a PDT would have a scrub, what's called a scrum master, which is a facilitator, a motivator. Uh, and then your team members tend to be made up of either groups of employees um, who want to, to instill change. You'd want a, a good mix. So you want the people that are actually going to be doing the work, you know, using the systems, using the processes. There's no point necessarily having a team member in your PDT that doesn't ever get involved in that process. Um, so I think it's key when formula in these sorts of teams that you pick the right people. Um, and the next sort of question again is question six. It, you know, now again, putting this together, if you were to put a PDT in place in your department, say, or your company, just jot a few people down who you may think you want to have in that team uh, and why potentially you'd want them in it. Um, because ultimately these are going to be your driving force to change. Um, and the potentially these are going to be the ones that then feed back from what that change looks like to say, yes, this is how we envisaged it or no, it's actually not how we envisaged it. If we come on to the next slide, linking with a PDT team, you'd have a PST, which is a product stakeholder team. And this is ultimately the people that may have to sign off on some change. Now, with payroll specifically, you'd probably find that it'll be if your PDT is made up majority of either specialists, it might be administrators, you, um, you may get involvement if you're in uh, accountancy practice from tax and audit um, from a point of view of how you as a payroll team impact their teams. And then to sign off anything, you'd probably have your payroll manager maybe on there or payroll director. You probably want an involvement from possibly a HR director. IT, if you have an internal IT team, um, or it could actually be getting your software development team in, in place, so be it a relationship manager or an account manager. Um, and ultimately, they, these are going to be the people that are going to say, well, actually, yes, we think they're great and we could see, you know, you're taking that forward. Um, if there's a cost implication, the chances are these people are going to be the ones that would have the, the yes or no to sign off any sort of change from a, an impact of cost. Um, so again, it, it's key to sort of make sure that these people are there to, you know, arrange meetings and, and sort of reviews of that. Um, and again, these would kind of assess and discuss and have the sort of background knowledge of what you'd be wanting as a, as a PDT to do. Um, and, and again, with that, be innovative. So, you know, the, the key is, you know, to, to try and drive innovation. You may want to look at who, the, who those people are. You know, are they, you know, someone that is going to be forthright with kind of driving change or, or not? Um, and this next session is, is, or next little section is to be innovative in general. Um, and I want you to kind of now ask yourself um, through some of the things we, we've talked about, have you at the moment ever challenged anything? So jot some things down. Have you actually looked at a process before that you thought could be better or could be different? and actually challenge that. If not, I want you to put a reason why you've not done it. Um, I always say the worst thing that can happen is someone says, no, we can't do it, or actually, yes, but let's look at it in a different way. You and your team potentially may have the answers. You just may not have been asked the question before. Um, and what I want you to try and do is actually ask those questions of yourself. So again, in question seven of our journey, um, if you're on your way to incorporate change, um, now is the plan to sort of challenge that change you may have highlighted. So answer first, like I said, have you challenged this before? If yes, how did you look at it? And did you look at it as the full 360? And if no, no, then write not, you know, write, write a reason why not. Next slide, please, hey. 
And, and again, I just wanted to revisit this section again, is to now say, now having known some of that stuff and looked at things in different ways potentially, if you have already started to analyse what affects you, your service, go back and revisit it. You know, look at it with a wider team, look at it wider than just payroll um, and, and think of using that sort of PDT team collaboration to do these sort of analysations of, of work and service. And um, so that was just very quickly just to say, look, really, you know, the key is revisit, revisit, revisit. And it may be revisiting as you kind of change teams or change members of PDTs as well. Um, again, I just flashed the, the SWOT analysis up again, and this is just to reinforce that again, do your SWOT analysis together as well. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing it individually, but ultimately, again, do it as a team as well, because you may again have different reasons as to why someone may mention something as a strength, and equally, someone may mention it as a weakness. And it's interesting to find out why each individual has, has stated it in that quadrant. So again, I'd encourage this is, is done in teams. Next little session, and apologies, I know I'm throwing loads of, of sort of different sort of uh, methods and, and data with you. Um, but once you've started and once you've now got into a, a way of working of analysing and you might have sort of tasks that you want to change, the next important thing that I always find is to actually weight um, a way of, of prioritising those. So you may have heard again of called something called weighted shortest job first or one weighted smallest job first. And again, in your own businesses, you, you'd have to kind of come up with your own way of, of scoring these. But ultimately, what I would always suggest is have two, two scoring methods. One, how it impacts service. So how a process or a task is impacting your service. And then the second, how long it may take to change or the impact it would take to change be it a cost and then score them either one to five one to ten it doesn't really matter you create your own scale give them those two scores add them up and then you can relatively sort of prioritize from them so for example if i used a one to five scale of how it input impact service one might be really important five not i rate something one on that and then my next thing is actually how you know hard it is to possibly change this big it cost etc i might now i might now say that's a three so my total score is four if another one it was one and one their total is two then two is a greater need that's a prioritization now so my two goes before my four um, and that's just a little example of how you can actually prioritize things and weight things and again i'd always suggest you do it in teams um, because, you, again, you'll have different opinions as to why something might be sort of rated different. Um, a couple more examples on, on the screen there is just li literally a high and low risk to develop and a high and low customer value. Uh, they've done it the opposite. So they've done it if it's in quadrant four, then it's an important one to change. If it's obviously in one, you know, don't, uh, don't necessarily. Um, or vice versa, one might be a real risk. So actually, let's change that because that's costing us. Uh, four, we don't necessarily need to change at the moment. Um, so now the, the next sort of question on a journey is, again, off that process or task that you've chose, rate, and again, I want you to pick your own scale, but rate how you think it would be to change. What score would you give it? be it a one to five on both or one to four is this example. I want you to just literally do that um, and keep a note. Uh, and my final little bit um, before I kind of sort of hand over is I want to use a, a football club analogy and apologies if, if no one follows football, um, uh, but obviously it's in the news a, a lot of the moment and especially since sort of uh, restarts in lockdown. Uh, but the reason I use football at, at this point is when you're thinking of certain teams or working together collaboratively, um, it's quite easy when looking at a football team to actually say, right, how do they operate? They don't get a team of forwards to play and only pick strikers um, because, yeah, they might have a little bit of success scoring goals, etc. but you'd be sure they'll let loads in. 
they ultimately also don't get one coach to take every training session. They literally will have a forward coach, a defending coach, a goalkeeping coach, etc. Likewise, they have all these team members playing part in that one goal or multiple goals to their end goal. Um, and again, the way they work in terms of week by week, ultimately, what they'll probably do on a Monday is analyse the match on a Saturday. They'll sit down together. They'll watch a video back, possibly. They'll chat what went wrong, what went right. Then they'll sort of plan, right, what do we need to do this week to work better? How do we look to change? How do we look to impact that? Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they'll work on that. And then Saturday, ultimately, that's them um, delivering, hopefully, what they think is something different. And they'll either go out and hopefully win again, or they might kind of at least kind of get a draw this time, or they might have maintained it. And they're constantly doing that on a weekly basis. So again, I always say to people, you know, look at sort of these teams and how they operate. Um, and you can take that same analogy and use it in a payroll. You can analyse the same way. You could do it weekly. I'm not saying you would, but do it monthly, do it quarterly, etc. But it's just a good one to use to get your, your minds thinking of, of how many people play a part in that change. Um, and finally, um, you know, a bit of my cheese moment. Um, but basically, yeah, together everyone does achieve more. So not really a question on this one. Um, but what I'd like you to do, hopefully, if you have kind of followed your journey along with us, at some point, be a bit interactive, a bit of a networking opportunity. Try and share your story that you've now created, hopefully, with someone either on this call or in the PBA or back in your team and actually go and share it with them to start to evolve and start to input that change. Apart from that, thank you very much. That's um, that's my very sort of brief overview of, of kind of getting you to think of change and think of agile methodology. Um, what I'm going to look to do now is hand over to Annette, who's going to delve into um, actual specifically Bureau migration. So thanks, Annette. Over to you. Thanks, Adam. I hope you all found that very interesting. Um, my name is Annette Gibbons from Think Payroll, and I'm really going to talk about kind of a lot of the physical tasks we need to do when we're thinking about um, migrating a payroll. Um, and we'll be using some of the analogies and things that Adam has been talking about. So if I could have the next slide, please. So the agenda, um, why, when and how, how, why are we doing this? We're going to talk about analysis, so the payroll analysis, but also the data analysis. We're going to talk a little bit about project planning, the project team, and then it takes us back into a circle of why, when and how. So preparation, I can't stress enough. I, I see so many people migrating payrolls within, you know, standard businesses or payroll bureaus and accountancy. Prepare, prepare, prepare. There's so much we need to do. If you're in a bureau or an accountancy, it's a whole different game doing a payroll migration than it is if you've only got one or two payrolls, because you've got to be thinking about your clients, your business. So put the time in to prepare and it's going to make your life so much easier. If we could move on. So the first thing you need to find out is why are you changing the system? Sometimes it's because your company have decided to change it or hopefully you'll be part of that reason of being able to choose a payroll system. Why, why do you need to change it? Do you need better communications? Do you need it to be cloud based? Do you need better reporting? So if you're at the situation where you can choose the payroll system, absolutely really sit there and go through, OK, why are we going to change it? Quite often you're told or you're you know you come in afterwards okay this payroll is gonna is gonna be the one you're gonna be using so you need to look at where are you going to get the wins what is going to make this new payroll system so much better than your last one the worst thing that people can do and the biggest mistake is they make the new system a mirror image of their last system and you say actually you know you've changed for a reason so actually where are you going to get the wins is that going to be you've suddenly got a portal now so you don't need to be sending emails and getting data from your clients? Is there a um, upgraded payroll portal, payslip portal, so all of the employees of your clients have, uh, have better access? 
Um, are you getting the wins from reporting? Quite often, a lot of the newer system have some really, really good reporting programs in it compared to some of the older ones that we use. But also the flip side, this payroll system you're using at the moment, OK, you might be changing it because you want better reporting, but it could be really good and sturdy. So take some time to look at your current offering and say, OK, what are the best things about that? What can we not afford to lose? And there's going to be compromise. Anytime you change to a new system, you're going to get some great but you may end up losing some of the basic functionality. You may have something that was bespoke and written for you. So you really want to, and again, probably using some of Adam's, you know, agile, when you're looking at how you're going to work out, sit there and go, what, what, what can't we afford to lose? And actually, what is a nice, but we need to need to do? Um, and when are you going to change a system? Now, I've been working in payroll for 30 odd years and we all wanted to change a system in April because of year end. Actually, we don't need to do that anymore. With good data processes, you can change your payroll any, or you can migrate payrolls anywhere throughout the year. If you're just a standalone payroll system, you might uh, you might only have one payroll that you need to change. Some of you guys, and I know I've been out to different bureaus, you might have five, six hundred payrolls that you are going to migrate. So you really need to look at when is the best time? How are you going to choose which payrolls that you migrate? What order are you going to do it in? Some of these projects are probably a year long project. So have a good project plan of when you're going to change it. And then really importantly, how are you going to change it? Are you going to change it? Are you going to have the resources yourself? Are you going to bring somebody in to help you? Are you going to stop somebody from being business as usual to run the project? So you've got to ask all of these questions. But what I would say is keep asking all these questions. You'll suddenly start to build a new system. Keep in mind why you're changing it. What are those wins you're going to get? Do you need to think about changing how you store the names of pay elements? You know, do you want the same across the board? Have you had payrolls come in from other systems and some of the coding is different, some of the costing is different? How can you make it as simple as possible and get the most wins out of this system? If we could move on to the next slide. So I'm sure most of you have probably got hundreds of payroll systems, oh, pay payrolls, sorry. So how are you going to decide what payrolls you're going to migrate first? Do you really know all the details about all of your payrolls? The first thing I would always recommend is do a payroll analysis. Now this isn't a five minute job and hopefully you've got a lot of this information. We start off with the basics. How many payrolls have you got? You know, you then need to look at frequency. Have you got weeklies, monthly, four weeklies? You've probably got a lot of annual payrolls. So you really need to look and say on a spreadsheet. OK, so I've got 500 payrolls. My frequency, I've got a mixture. But then we need to look at payday because we know that everyone doesn't pay on the same day. Building that up analysis, you want to look at the payroll rules. So the things like um, pro rata in rules, because really what we want to do is actually be able to block these payrolls into different areas. So it could be, OK, out of my 500 payrolls, I've got 20 payrolls that all have the same pro rata rules. They have the same pension schemes. They have the same frequency. Oh, actually, maybe I could migrate this chunk as a group together. Um, you need to look at your salary and your hourly rules. But again, really dig down into how do those payrolls work? If somebody's coming in and going to build you a new system, they're going to need to know what's taxable, what's eniable, what's pensionable, or oh, this payroll works on a 260 pro rata, this one works on calendar days, this one has a pension scheme and it's qualifying earnings, these companies use qualifying earnings but only on a certain few elements that we've chosen. So I would say a big 
process again with the preparation is you start to analyze all of your payrolls um, if you're using some kind some of the softwares out there that have the workflows you may have a lot of this built in already a lot of the older systems don't so it's then looking at how you're going to do this is it literally a spreadsheet that you're going to build up all of that data on because once you've got all of this analysis, this is going to be part of your project planning of how you're then going to move on and how you're going to actually migrate these payrolls. It's really good to get different people to work on this. And I know Adam was talking about getting different people at different levels because a payroll manager may look at this and say, right, OK, I know we've got 250 payrolls and this is how we're going to split it. The people on the ground running those payroll every day will know all of those little complexities and they're the things that often get lost when you're migrating. So in a way, this kind of needs to be like your payroll Bible. Every bit of information needs to be analysed so you can see as you build a new payroll system, what kind of information do I need? You're going to need all of this information to hand. Could we go on to the next one? Employee data, one little, one little tab, one little word. There is so much information that you need to be getting and getting correctly. I see a lot of older payroll systems where the data maybe isn't that clean. Um, by clean, I mean there's maybe there's a mixture of uppercase and lowercase. There's some dashes when there shouldn't be. There's, um, I've found a lot of places that have got incorrect data, old, old addresses. Um, so you really want to go through and not only just analyze your data, but cleanse your data because it's all well and good knowing you've got your 500 employees, but that could be 25,000, um, sorry, or 500 payrolls, that could be 25,000 employees. You wanna make sure when you're moving to your new system and you're still thinking, okay, I wanna get the wins from this new system. You want the best data to go across to that new system. So is it the fact that, and you need to look at how you're gonna analyze and cleanse this data. Is this something you could do as part of your preparation um, of your business as usual for each of your um, payroll administrators to actually go through and be cleansing that data. But we then have to get that data Oh, I think we've whizzed on sorry, a little bit, sorry. sorry. Um, we've also then got to think of this data analysis and how you're going to get it out of the system. Now, nine times out of 10, you are going to be putting this data into a CSV file because you're going to export your data probably from your old system. Maybe you have to do some work on it and then you're going to have to import it, whether yourself or your software provider will import it in. So really, think about how you're going to format that data when it comes out. One of the biggest things you see is people put things into a CSV file, they save it and open it and of course they've lost all of their leading zeros or something like that and it seems such a simple mistake and they try to load it and suddenly sort codes have only got five digits and some dates of births are missing. I see this error pretty much in every migration you ever go to do. So once you've analysed your data and you've got your data out, make sure you keep it in a really, really good format. Prepare, think about how you're going to do that. If we can move on to the next screen. Now, this is really important. Who is going to do this? First of all, you need to make sure you've got the buy-in from these people. Again, going back, why are you changing the system? This group of people, you want to, them to be knowing what wins they're going to get. Migrating payrolls can be quite a tedious piece of work, especially if you've got, I don't know, 50 director-only payrolls. You want to be thinking you, this team needs to really buy in about you're making your system better to make their day better. So who's going to be in your project team? Yes, you need your project leader. Now, quite often I, I go into companies and they say, well, you know, oh, Mabel's been here forever. She knows everything inside out. Mabel's going to do it all on her own. How do you get the buy-in then from other people? If you've got a big team, you need to make sure that this project team is made up from people who do different jobs within the payroll, because you may find Mabel does know the payroll inside out, but you know the new payroll that's come in that's got these complex 
manual calculations or something, somebody else is going to know. So you need this group of people to people that really have a mixture of skills, whether you need your technical people for bringing the data over, but also you need your payroll people that once you've loaded some data, you want somebody that can look at that data and see what's right and what's wrong. You want to be able to do parallel runs. So you need somebody that have, has that knowledge to look at it. So if you've got the, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a big project team, you know, build it up. You've got somebody that's at the top who is the stakeholder, but then you've got the doers who really understand why you're trying to, what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it. But if you've got your team doing this, who's doing the day job? So are you going to move somebody out of business as usual? Are you going to split their day job? So they're doing a bit of normal payroll plus a bit of um, implementation. Are you going to get an external resource in? In a way, you kind of want a mixture of all of that because you don't want a project team working away on this. And then you've got 10 members of your payroll team saying, oh, I'm not sure about this new payroll system. I have not seen it. I've not got my hands on it. I've only seen it in training. It's really good to keep as many of your team members as involved as possible because you want everybody to be buying into your new system. Obviously, business as usual has to happen. You still need to be paying people correctly and on time, but you really want to get them involved, whether, whether they have a, a small payroll that you're going to get them involved in but really think so you want a core project team but then a wider team so people can really understand what's happening why is it happening and getting their buying because a lot of people are quite scared of new of new payroll systems or of new anything changing really so you really want to get them to get that buy-in and understand what's going on if we can move on to the next so project planning, you know why you know why you're getting your payroll system, you know when you're getting your payroll system, you know who's going to do it, and now you really need to start that project plan. So you've got your team. What time frame? I mean, some people have called me up and said, right, yeah, we've just got a new system, we want to go in live in three months, and we've got 400 payrolls. So when I get off the floor from laughing, I say, okay, right, let's let's really have a look at our time frames. This is a long project. You need to look at it. Maybe you're changing your payroll system because your current system can't deal with something that some of your bigger clients have. OK, you that comes into your time frame. This is what we need to do first. But you need this is probably depending on the size of your payroll could be a year's project. So really look at how long you're going to do this, but give yourself time for building a payroll. And when I talk about building it, You've, you're going to get an empty payroll system. You've got to build in your rules, your paydays, what taxable, what's deniable. Hopefully from doing all of your analysis and your preparation, you'll be able to look and say, actually, 75% of these payrolls all use the same basic pay. So it's taxable, deniable, pensionable. OK, I can build that. So what you want to start being able to do is build master payrolls and say this is a master standard payroll. I can then copy that data to all of these others. You're obviously not going to be able to do that for all of them because you will have some that are just very, very different. Once you've built your payrolls, you then need to look at loading your data. Again, this is where we hope your data analysis has come in because you've gone through, you've cleansed your data, you've looked at all the oddities. So you should, you know about you see your CSV files, so you're keeping everything in a good place and you're going to be loading that data. But obviously it isn't just data, is it? This is people's pay that we're talking about. So data checks. You've got to be running reports from your new system to make sure it matches your old system. Have you, has everything imported okay? Have you, you know, you haven't missed off a zero somewhere. Once you've done your data checks, you've also got to think about training. So your project team will probably know that payroll system inside out because they've been doing all the migrations. What about the rest of your team? So this is where I say it's really good to try and get them involved some way along the project as well that doesn't always happen sometimes they need then that training and absolutely key as well is communication 
you're going to be communicating to all of your clients why there's a new payroll system. Why does it look different? What does it mean to them? You're going to communicate to other parts of your company. Are, is there going to be different kind of backed protocols? Is there different IT um, issues that you need? So you've got to be communicating just to a, a huge variety of people. Now, this here is in an arrow, but pretty much a lot of this stuff is going on at the same time because you're going to build one payroll and probably load it, check it, make sure it's all OK. So this is just busy and you're going to repeat this and repeat this. So the preparation is just absolutely key for doing this. If we can move along. I know you're probably bored of me saying preparation, but it's absolutely key if you put in the hard work i would say for a project for implementing um a new payroll system in a bureau the first couple of months you're doing the preparation you're getting that data you're getting it clean you're building your systems you're talking to people about why you're doing it so just prepare 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 and then finally i've come back to this bit of whistle stop because i know we didn't have very long to do this so Always keep in your head why you're changing the system. Even what we did at one client, we literally had these questions stuck or these things stuck up on a wall. So when they're sitting there and it's like, oh, I've just migrated, you know, my 50th payroll, it's all, why? Just think about the whole time, what wins you're gonna get about this. And make sure as you're loading your data, you're not going to do anything that will, will stop those or will hinder any of those losses. So if you know suddenly this new system isn't going to do a weird or wonderful calculation, let's see if by getting the data in a good format, if building some reports, you can actually do something to help that the whole way you go. And again, keep thinking about when you're going to change it. This could be a project, so a long project. So when you're communicating out, you might communicate to all of your standard director payrolls that, you know, they are being changed in April. But then when is a good time to change some of these other payrolls? So thinking about the whole time why you're changing it and that resourcing is so important the, to get that resource right. The worst thing is halfway through implementing a new system, the person who knows everything suddenly gone and got another job. So make sure you are absolutely keeping the resourcing, moving it around, making sure that everybody has got a real buy in of what they want to be doing. Well, wow, three o'clock. I know we told an hour, so I'm going to really stop there. And I know that was very whistle stop, but I know we'd really like to go through if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Annette. I personally, from where I where I work, I've, I've, I've faced a lot of that migration project stuff myself. So, um, yeah, great, great session. And thank you, Adam, as well. Um, if you have got any questions, please use the raise hand function. I will unmute you and you can ask your question to, to whom you would like. So are there any questions? If somebody or has questions different? and they don't want to be asking everything, they can obviously let um, PBA know and they'll pass yeah. them on to us. If you have got any questions that you don't want to talk about here, please let us know. Yeah, please, please let us know through either emailing the PBA or in the LinkedIn group or through the new website that's been launched. There's a contact us section. So any form of contact, just drop it across. And we'll, we'll make sure that Annette and Adam receive any questions. Um, now that there isn't actually any questions, I can announce our next webinar. So we are delighted to welcome back Kate Upcraft on the 3rd of November at two o'clock. And she'll be talking about the new job support scheme which I know will be a popular session. So we will announce and release sort of the registration link, uh, I believe tomorrow. So once that's up and running, please do register. It, you know, there, are, there is a cap on how many people we can have on these Zoom sessions. So make sure you register in time. It's gonna be a very poignant session, I'm sure, for, for everyone involved. So um, on behalf of everyone at the PBA, thank you all for attending. Um, and again, if you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.